All right, folks, we're talking with journalist John Kelman. You know him from uh, All About Jazz, and uh, he's one of the foremost experts in the world. I don't mean to embarrass you, John, on ECM Records. You are. <laughs> All right, man, let me tell you real quickly what we've been listening to so you have an idea. We started at noon, and um, I'm kind of gearing this toward folks who might not be familiar with ECM and, okay. and trying to show the, uh, the breadth of the, uh, of the label. We started off with the first recording, Mel Waldron Trio. We heard Willow Weep yep. from me from Free at Last. Then we went to something real recent. Uh, I'm probably going to butcher this name, Maria Farantori and Sihan... Yep. Yeah, okay. Yep. We heard some of that, and then we heard Cloud About Mercury, then we heard Cadona, then we heard Ribdahl from uh, Vasa Brig. Yep. And then we heard... Love uh, that record. Say it again, man. Love that record. Yeah, me too. And please feel free to correct me on any of my pronunciations. Um, yep. Then we went into a little bit of new series stuff with John Adams from Harmonia. We heard Negative Love. Yep. And then we heard from Stefano Battaglia from Re Pasolini. Uh. And we just heard Carla from Social Studies, Floater. Uh, which, which song from Social Studies? From Social Studies, we heard Floater. Okay, great. Yeah. So, uh, That's with, one of my favorite. Yeah, man, m- me too. Okay, so let's start out with uh, your introduction to ECM. Well, it kind of came twofold. Um, I was playing in a band in the early 70s, and... Somebody brought Return to Forever, Kid Korea's first album, uh, not the electric version, uh, but with um, uh, Erico Moriera. Oh, and uh, Joe Farrell? Yeah. Stanley Clark and Joe Farrell, yeah. Yeah. And so, and I knew a band that was actually playing Return to Forever, like a rock band. Um, wow. So that was my introduction. Oops, my introduction to the label. But the first PCM album I actually owned was a gift from a friend of mine uh, when I turned 18 in uh, 1974, and it was Gary Burton Ring, and that was and remains one of my most loved records, and it. W- I was always one of these guys who started off with uh, one album, looked at it, who played on it, and then started going from there. Uh, so that was a good introduction to a lot of musicians. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds like you got into them the year before I did. A friend of mine, if you're listening, Jeff Burton, turned me <laughs> on to ECM. Um, I got into Towner in Oregon in concert and Rib Dolls, whenever I seem to be far away at the, at the same time, then oh. I saw Towner yeah. at Amazing Grace and about a month later saw Oregon. Now, they were still with, oh. with Vanguard at the time. but um, Yeah, I, was, I saw Oregon a lot in the 70s. In fact, I actually spent a weekend with them uh, in Montreal because I had a friend. Uh, I was not a journalist then. And he uh, he knew Ralph, so they actually booked us in the same hotel, <laughs> and they were playing two nights there. And I'm so um, happy that I got to spend time with Colin Walcott. Yeah. Because of course, a few years later, he was gone. Yeah. Yeah. So you know, it was an experience. But yeah, I, I was a big Oregon fan. Around the same time, uh, Winter Light, 1973. Okay. I think. Yeah, or four. Well, one of the things I uh, started talking about a little earlier in the show, and I'd love for you to expand on this. Um, one of the great treats of ECM for me is the combination of unusual and unexpected instruments that most producers wouldn't do for one song, let alone a whole album of pipe organ and saxophone or... You know, yep. so would you care to speak to the instrumentation? Well, I think that a lot of it, you know, as as everything does with ECM, goes back to Manfred Eicher. Uh, okay, now this is funny. Producer. I don't mean to interrupt you, man, but every mm-hmm. single person that says his name says it different. Yep. I don't know whether it's Eicher or Eicher. I believe it's Eicher. Uh, I've met him a few times. 
Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, oh my God. So either okay. either he was being very polite, or uh, I got it right. Okay. Today I'll call him Eicher. <laughs> yep. But it, 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 it's like mine. It, it, it's six. One half a dozen of the other, you know. Yeah, Manfred E. So anyway, yeah. um, you were saying that uh, that that this instrumentation that it all all goes back to the visionary, Mister Manfred. I think so. Well, I think everything does. Uh, I, you know, I hate to. I know that there are people who hate to, you know, say this, but it's the truth. I mean, the vision of the of the album. Oh, sorry, the vision of the label. Um, was his from the start, and, you know, from very early on, he had this interest in not just bringing different instrumentation together, but bringing together musicians who may have never met, um, and see what happened. Like, the, the group Solstice, uh, with Ralph Counter, it was his album, but became a group with Jan Gabarek on saxophone, Eberhard Faber on his weird electric bass that wasn't really, it looked more like a cello, uh, and um, Jon Christensen, the, you know, amazing Norwegian drummer. Now, that's more instrumentation, sort of, because, you know, what jazz band at that time, other than Oregon, uh, used the twelve-string electric guitar as a main instrument. Yeah, yeah. But but you know, then you get into things like Pedona, of course, where there. I mean, I, I can't count the number of instruments that these guys played, um, ranging from you know barimbo to guitar, uh, just you know. But I think I think Manfred just, you know, had this idea that these things would work. And more often than not, they did. Yeah, yeah. We were talking to uh, Nick Berch last oh. year. He was in the studio, and um, yep. I remember asking him if Manfred had any, uh, you know, what, what Manfred's input was to the sessions. And... Uh, he said, "You know, it's a really, it's a really mysterious thing. He doesn't say much to you, but it might be something as little as, instead of trying that solo on tenor, try yeah. it on flute. Or there was, I think, one thing. I think it was the older, the quintet of uh, Ronan yeah. when they had the percussionist. There was a little bell sound, and and Manfred felt that it was uh, kind of interfering with the piano overtones at a moment where there was some silence. So mm -hmm. little, the littlest things that make the most major changes. Take out the bell there so I can hear the piano ringing. Yep, absolutely. He's got ears that hear things most mortals do not. <laughs> um, even even now, at, at, at you know, in his seventies, you know, he hears stuff. But the thing I was going to say about that um, is, you know, because I've done a liner notes for ECM and I've um, contributed to a couple of books, um, I've had the opportunity to speak to some of the musicians and I often ask them exactly that question, you know, what Manfred's involvement. And, you know, the bottom line is... Um, he is one of the few truly active producers, I think, that's left in, in, the, in the jazz world. A guy who gets involved in uh, instrumentation choices. You know, I remember one album, and he said, like, you know, let's, instead of trying bass, let's try cello, you know. Or uh, actual real arrangement differences. Um, you know, let's move this section there, um, things like that. He's, he's oftentimes in the room while they're recording, and sometimes it's just gestures that, you know, like, say, more of this, you know, or whatever. Yeah. Can you remember any other stories from some of the musicians you've talked to? Because that's something I'm really 
curious about is... I got one. Yeah, Manfred's <laughs> in, Manfred's input into the sessions. Yeah, go. I love okay, anything well, you got, this man. Is, this is not exactly Manfred's input into the session, but it's sort of a funny story I got from Peter Erskine. Um, Drummer, okay. Yeah, he just told me when he was in um, Rainbow in Oslo. Um, Rainbow, that's Rainbow that, Studios for you folks? Yes, which is which is actually one of two, because there was a first Rainbow uh, that had to move, and so they went to a second location, uh, and I actually visited that in 2009 and interviewed Jan Eric Kongshug. Oh, wow, man. Yeah, it was an uh, experience. For me, it was pilgrimage. You yeah, know? I'll bet. <laughs> uh, I'll bet, man. You should have called me. I was in Oslo. <laughs> I had to go, you know. So anyway, um, Peter tells me that, you know, like you just said, you know, he doesn't often necessarily speak. And, you know, his relationship with engineers is interesting because, um, again, you know, he rarely speaks. But they know each other so well that there's this unspoken thing happening between them. Anyway, so Peter tells me that, you know, you do a take and, you know, if he's sitting in the control room and reading a newspaper, you know it's not going well. <laughs> if he's in the new if he's in the control room and he's reading a Norwegian newspaper, you know it's really going really badly because he doesn't read Norwegian. <laughs> <laughs> so I always remember that one, you know. Well, um, wow. I wonder if the albums come out, if he ends up reading a Norwegian newspaper through half the session. I wonder if they even get released. Well, not necessarily the album, but maybe the take. Yeah, okay. You know, and, and one thing about ECM is they clearly don't seem to be uh, either, they either, either don't keep them or they have no interest in releasing, you know, like so many labels are now, you know, alternate takes and outtakes and mixes and things like that. I think he views that when an album is done, that's, uh, that's the material. And I'm speaking for him, which is a bad thing, really. I should, uh, but but it's my impression. Well, you know, it's interesting. There are a couple of uh, numbers that are missing. You know, for those of you listening, you know how records all number their releases, and they're chronological. There's some numbers missing in the catalog. It, it jumped from this number, and the next release skipped a, a, a number or two. If I'm, if I'm being clear here at all. So I wondered yep. if he's kept any in the can. I also wonder if there's any live recordings that he's keeping in the can. And, um, yeah, I just... Well, I, can't, I can't speak to that with any authority, uh, except that I would imagine the answer is yes, because, um, you know, look what happened. They found that wonderful uh, Magico... Uh, live album with Gabarek on sax, uh, the great Brazilian guitarist slash pianist Egberto Gismonti, and um, bassist Charlie Hayden. Yeah. Um, and then, so I, I think they probably are, but, you know, like, one of the things that's happened this year that has been, for me, a, you know, wish come true has been that there was a period of about a month where every week they were releasing seven or eight titles that had never been available in the digital realm in any way, not on CD or anything, and they were all being released in high resolution as digital downloads only. Yeah. And some of them were quite esoteric and rare, um, but... Some were albums I've been wondering where they've been, like uh, Jack Dijonette's two uh, Directions albums yeah. uh, from 76 and 77, um, Untitled and New Rags. So, um, you know, 
he's, he's, he, for me, I've been waiting for these things to come out remastered and, and you know, sounding as good as they should. I had final the CDR rips of them. Uh, and now I've completely forgotten the question you asked. <laughs> oh, we're just we're, we're just talking, man. We're just talking. You know, yeah. um, one thing that surprised me, or or, or makes me wonder, oh, is the numbers missing numbers. I've seen their I've seen their release schedule. Okay. Um, once, and you know, sometimes like the plans are out. You know, years, literally years. You know, um, and so I think some just either don't come to pass um, or, or, or maybe they're in the can I don't but I don't think they have much but what I do know is that Manfred like this gift of all these unreleased albums that's where I'm thinking the gift was because Manfred while he recognizes that there are albums people want to be able to have access to um, and you know, he also does it with, like, these touchstone series of uh, yeah. cardboard sleeve versions of stuff. Right. But his real focus is on now and what's happening here. Yeah. Um, he doesn't really like looking back. Um, but, the, but, but, that, that, but he recognizes people are definitely demanding. Okay, I got to interrupt you for a second, my brother. Um, yeah. You're breaking up a little bit. I don't know if there's anything you, oh. you can do. Um, no, I'm on just a landline. Okay, man. Um, it's not horrible. I mean, we're understanding you. Um, okay. I also, also wondering, John, if you have any insight into this, what comes out? Okay, let me rephrase for folks. ECM Records is a label that puts out all kinds of music, and it's all on the label ECM Records. Now, they also, as I told you a little while ago, have the ECM New Series label, which is all the chamber, symphonic, and orchestral music. Um, I don't like to say classical, because that's one period, but for brevity's sake, yeah. the classical label. Now, why does an album like Lux Eterna by Ribdahl, with orchestra, pipe organ, guitar, why is that, on, do you have any insight in, uh, as to what, orchestral works that come out on the regular ECM label, why they're not on the ECM yep. new series? Well, um, but the short one is I think that it, um, it's just a man for decision, but there is, a re there is reason to it. Um, the division between the regular series and new series is not really so much, even I understand you using a broad term classical, um, it's really, uh, and uh, it's really improvisation versus scored. Uh, now that doesn't mean okay. that stuff isn't scored on regular series. You, you know, no, I get you now. I get, yeah. is part of it. Okay, sure, sure, sure. So if it's pretty much written out, it gets on on new series. If it, if it does include improvisation, and that's something we, I haven't mentioned to you listeners today, hmm. uh, one of the uh, cornerstones of what ECM is all about is instant composition and improvisation. And um, there, there's all kinds of different ways, as you know, musicians put together pieces of work. Sometimes it's just a melody at the top and the tail. Sometimes it's a, a, a diagram. Sometimes nothing is spoken. Um, yeah, so... I have a good example of one. Please. That was actually kind of reversed. When I interviewed John Thurman, the amazing British um, saxophonist and bass clarinetist, who now lives in Oslo, um, back in 2009, uh, we were talking about, um, you know, um, sorry, my brain just cramped. Um, okay, I got it. I picked it up. Here it is. There you go. <laughs> No, no, yeah. The, the no. The question. The, the question was, right? Oh, the question. Oh no. Uh, what were we talking about? I, geez, now you caught me with my brain on the floor. Um, that's not fair. Uh, I remember, no, it's okay. Oh, I John, Sir, John Sermon. John Sermon. Yeah. Yeah. He when he did this fantastic album with guitarist Mick Goodrick, um, who played on Gary Burton's Ring, coincidentally. Right. Um, 
and is way too underknown uh, by most people. Anyway, he did one solo album for ECM in 1979 called In Passing. And it was with Don Thurman, uh, Eddie Gomez, and uh, oh, Brain Cramp, probably Jack Isnet. Um, anyway, all Mick brought the sessions were charts of chord changes. And so when you hear a song like Summer Band Camp, which has a very compelling me- melody, that was completely improvised by John because he had nothing to work with other than chord changes. Oh, wow. <laughs> so, you know, but, and yet he manages, and that's what, that's what the beauty of, um, of the label and many of the artists on it is, is that, you know, they don't just blow, they blow with a compositional focus. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Um, one thing that I wish Manfred would have done is record Oregon. For those of you familiar with Oregon, um, the quartet, they have done some performances with orchestra. Yeah, and, they and, did. Uh, they did an album for Intuition called uh, In Moscow. In Moscow. Right, but yeah. I have a recording from 1983, um, oh. I want to say from Freeburg, and that's when they were with ECM, and it's yeah. with the orchestra, and uh, the difference, obviously, between In Moscow and this recording is Colin was alive, and there's like a 20-minute uh, yeah. piece, uh, a 20-minute reading of... Um, Longing so long with orchestra. Um, I, I'm a, side note: We must talk later. <laughs> yeah, listen. <laughs> listen it, well, it's funny, you know. I never liked the Grateful Dead all throughout the 20th century. I just could not get yep. into them. I'm I'm a yep. big fan now, and I love Me them, too. and I love Dead and Company, but. I remember throughout the 20th century hearing people talk about the tapes and the live versions and this version. of, the, And I, I was always like, man, I wish you could see Oregon. Because they used to come to a place called the Amazing Grace in Evanston, Illinois. A little room. You'd sit on the floor. It was a bring your own if you wanted wow. uh, wine. I, I literally, John, would sit two feet from Colin or Ralph or Glenn wow. or Paul. And they would come for the Friday, the Saturday, and the Sunday and do two sets a night. So I honestly cannot tell you how many times I've seen Oregon. It's countless times. I was lucky because they played Montreal a lot in the 70s and early 80s. And so I probably didn't see them as many times as you did. But I saw them many, many times during that time as well. And uh, it was special. I mean, with Colin, I mean, they were great after. And they still are, well... I don't know if they are still, I don't know if they're still going. Um, you know, since Glenn left, they replaced the basis, but I haven't heard any news. Well, I just uh, heard something. The album. I just read something on Facebook. Uh, I guess Paul's rather sick. I mean, I don't I want to, I yes. shouldn't be saying that over the air, actually, but um, yeah. I've, I've heard no. that. And Ralph mentioned that to me at Martyrs. Uh, in, uh-huh. When was he here? God, I don't know, February or something, April. I don't know, Ralph was just here again. And, yeah. uh, but, uh, uh, yeah, um, Oregon. He's a, yeah. So I was just going to say, Ralph is a funny guy, isn't he? He is, man. You know, I have, a, I have kind of a strange relationship with him because I've opened for him and I've taped some of his shows with, with permission, but he never seems to remember exactly who I am. But this time, <laughs> he waved at me as soon as he came down after the show, and I was like, oh, Ralph remembers who I am. <laughs> And that's and that is great. No, I mean I I got to know him pretty early, and then he found then I became a writer, and it sort of uh, changed our relationship. Um, For the better or the worse. I always think of Ralph is you know he's such a meticulous player, uh, whether it's on guitar or piano or even trumpet, you know. Yeah. But he looks like a guy who slept in his suit took it off, got run over by a truck, put it back on. He's always such a sloppy-looking kind of guy. And I don't mean to say this in a negative way. It's just that he's so meticulous, and 
as a person, he's so much, um, he's so loose. I know. And when you, know? you talk to him, he's like the friendliest, uh, genuinely, um, not yep. false humility, but just, uh, yep. I mean, he knows who he is, but he doesn't throw it at you. No, absolutely not. Um, yeah. But he's a very funny guy. As yeah. was John Abercrombie, you know. Uh I, I mean, only saw him with Gateway, um, oh, nice. and with and with Ralph. I, 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 oh, you okay. probably talked to John, haven't you? Well, yeah, because I did the liner notes for the first quartet box. Oh, right, right, but right. Okay, I already yeah. met him um, a number of times. Um, I think the first time I met him was when he played the ECM 40th anniversary at Enjoy Jazz in Mannheim, Germany. Um, and I was invited to cover it, and um, he played there with the current group Ben, which was the string one with Mark Bell on violin, uh, Drew Gress on double bass, and Joey Barron. Ah, but Joey then, Barron. you know, oh. he played Ottawa, a friend of mine brought him, uh, and that was when he was playing with Mark Copeland and Drew and Joey Barron. Um, so we had, we'd have had opportunity to talk a number of times, so it made the liner notes very easy. Um, and he's a funny guy, but even funnier is Richie Birak. The piano yeah. player, okay. Yeah. Um, I was speaking to him at, he was living in Leipzig at the time in Germany, or maybe Leipzig, and um, it was 8 o'clock in the morning here. My wife was asleep, and he had me howling um, so much that my wife got woken up, which is, she's a lovely woman. I've been with love of my life, but at the time, that wasn't a good thing. So she comes into the office, and she's glaring at me, and I put him on speakerphone, and I say, but listen to this, and within about three seconds, she was howling. <laughs> so he's a funny guy, a funny guy, and, and actually one of the sad things is that his three albums, 3CM, although they've been released on CD in Japan, they've never been released sort of internationally. And I hope they'll be a part of this ongoing digital reissue series, because they're amazing. Yeah. You know, speaking of Abercrombie, um, I, I remember reading some people on some forums, I don't know which ones, uh, what's, what's the name of the DVD again? Do you remember? Uh, oh, uh, me um, meeting John. Is it? Yeah, John yeah, yeah, it might be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. Rem I remember reading a couple people say they they didn't care for it, that it didn't touch on this and it didn't touch on that. And and my take on it is, and I want to see if you agree with me or, or how you feel. I thought it was an it wasn't supposed to be a, a life documentary. Uh, to me, it's, it, it, it really got across the loneliness, <laughs> to me, of being a touring musician. This is what I do, and this is what my life is like. Yeah. Uh, that, that's like an interesting perspective that I had actually never thought of, to be honest, because uh, I'm afraid I'm one of the guys who was, like you said, uh, my review, while it was kind to the director, I felt that, you know, he had a lot of missed opportunities there. Oh, God. Um, I swear to God, John, I wasn't talking to you. I don't, I probably no, read no, your I review. Know, I know, But I, I do I remember know. I did read that, yeah, but I wasn't talking yeah. to you, man, I swear. No, okay, no, I understand yeah. that. No, I, and, and even if you did, it's okay. <laughs> I have no offense. You know, I mean, like, if people don't agree with me, that's okay. Um, but I just felt that there were a lot of opportunities that he missed at least, I mean, Ralph Towner was such an important influence on John as a composer in his early days. I mean, when, when John did Timeless, you know, he was not really a writer. Um, and if you listen to Timeless, his first DCM album from 75, and compare it even to Characters, his amazing solo guitar record from 77, and then the first quartet, you know, Arcade, uh, Abercrombie Quartet, and M from 79 to 81, you hear his compositional voice emerge. And that's 
very much because of Ralph. And yet Ralph, other than a very quick picture flashing by, wasn't mentioned. Wasn't, yeah, I hear you. Believe me, I you do. Know? Well, you Sorry, know, but, but, but your perspective is an interesting one that I hadn't thought about. So uh, thank you for that. Well, it kind of harks back to what you said that Manfred, you know, he and most of us that are artists, you know, we're interested in now. We're not interested in what we did 20 years ago. Yeah. So I kind of thought it was kind of poignant because I don't know, maybe I was projecting, you know, but I felt no, that it, it, I felt that it, it was a very a lonely, lonely feeling to that that documentary, and I thought it was. This is what it's like to be John Abercrombie, folks. You know, I got to leave my wife in the middle of winter. I got to get on the road, and here's the little, you know, place we're playing, and this is what yeah. I do. <laughs> it's, no, you're absolutely right, and it's and it's a truth. You know, I mean, people think um, that being a traveling musician is somehow a you know a glorious thing, and you know the truth is, you know, I spoke to Nils Petter Mulver, who I know pretty well. Um, the first time I met him, you know, and, you know, we talk a bit about that and how even a guy deals with, you know, he had just flown in from Oslo to Ottawa, six hour time difference. Um, and how do you face that? And he said, you know, it's a funny thing that, you know, when you're going to the gig, you're absolutely exhausted, but the minute you hit the stage, everything changes and it's all for the moment and you're no longer tired you know i mean i saw jan abercrombie when he was dealing with severe back problems um really bad back pain issues and yet when he hit the stage well i mean to say hit he, he had to, he had to <laughs> kind of take it slow to the stage but man when he started playing it was it's like any time other, you know. Yeah. You know. Well, you know, speaking of omissions, I was shocked. And again, I'm not trying to get into a gossip thing here about who gets, a, who gets along and who doesn't get along. But I was shocked that the Eberhard Weber documentary didn't mention Reiner Bruninghaus once. What that's is true. up with that? I, I, and that's a very good question. Because there's no... Um, Issues that I'm aware of. I mean, you know, Reiner still plays with Jan Gabarik when he tours with his group. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, they don't record on ECM very much anymore, but they're still part of the family. Um, and you're right. Free, Freeway, his first album with, from, I think, 76, is... Uh, One of my favorite uh, albums. Is a hidden gem. One of my favorite albums. I've got a cue. I, I hope I get to it. I'm not going to, for those of you listening, we're going to feature ECM again. You know, you, as you know, if you listen to my show regularly, ECM Records, you probably hear at least one or two or three things almost every show. But we're going to do <laughs> another all ECM show again before the end of the year. Maybe we'll check in with John again. Um, yeah. But I have in the queue here, uh, Die Fluss hinauf, the first cut off the second side. Um, I love that album. And another album I think they've really got to reissue because it is a space music classic. They've mm -hmm. got to reissue Three Day Moon by Bar Phillips. Yeah, I mean, I'm lucky because I've got the CD of that. You have a I CD mean, of that? About yeah, yeah, it's on, it was, yeah, it was on CD. But what, one of the sad things about ECM is that, you know, having to, having to face the reality of the times, um, when they first came out, and for probably the first two, maybe even three decades, um, ECM's m philosophy was that no album would ever be out of print. It would always be available. Yeah. Uh, but, of course, you know, changes in the industry and everything means that's no longer possible. And so they're doing these reissue series. And Three Day Moon, probably, I, I, I would be surprised if it does people at a day again. Okay, say that last part again. The last sentence broke up. Sorry, I, I said I, I would be very surprised if uh, Three Day Moon doesn't show up again at some point. Yeah, because, uh, now I got a weird oh. little story about that album. The last piece, S, C, and W, I listen and I listen and I listen. 
And as a guitarist or any instrumentalist, you know, you're goofing around one day and you're like, hey, that's that song. So yep. you kind of go and figure it out. Now, I was playing it in an open C tuning on okay. guitar, and I'm like, hey, this is SC and W by uh, Bar Phillips. I'm going to go try to learn this. Tell me if you can back this up, because this is why I'm bringing this up. I seem to remember reading somewhere in the days before the intrawebs in yep. uh, print somewhere that SC and, and okay, uh, to back up, when I did it on the guitar, it, it, it had, had a kind of a country feel to it. Mm -hmm. And I, I seem to remember reading an interview with him, and I can't remember ever reading an interview with him, but uh, where Bar Phillips, bassist and composer, said that, that those initials stood for space, country, and western. So I, I was like, wow, I guess I kind of, by osmosis, gleaned that, even though I didn't mean to. Do you remember yep. him saying that anywhere? Did I'm I? afraid I don't. Okay, maybe I made but that up. Maybe I made that no, up. No, <laughs> but it's possible. <laughs> but, but the thing is, is that, you see, these things, I can be, I could believe him saying that because one of the things that you know as a musician and I live with as well is the idea that people never really know the totality of who you are musically. Um, you know, people who follow uh, John Abercrombie, you know, don't know that he did certain groupings that never got recorded, but maybe just did a three-week tour of Europe. Um, Bill Frizzell is doing a great thing with his live download series, which you can buy these soundboard recordings from his website. And the great thing about them is many of them are groupings that have never been documented anywhere else. Is he really? I didn't know about this. Thank you. Uh, tell When I shut up, tell our listeners a little bit more about that Frizzell series. But well, is he releasing well, okay. any of the Gnostic Trio or Zorn stuff? or? No, that's not on there. Okay. I, and I don't know if it ever would be because I think that John Zorn holds a real iron fist with with his label stuff. Okay, yeah, I don't um, blame him. I don't blame him, but okay. But no, absolutely not. You know, he's created a cottage industry that's amazing. Um, I, I feel bad, but, too, because my wife and I bought Book Pariah through Pledge. Yeah, I've got, yeah, oh, that whole thing. Oh. Yeah. When, when, yeah, Pledge Music didn't. You know, I mean, this is, this is a, it's an idea of a, something for musicians, and they, they walk off with the money. <laughs> Well, uh, yeah, you know, yeah. someday off, off mic, you and I will talk. I, I have a lot of theories, and uh, I, I try to put them away over the decades, and they just keep coming back like a bad rash. Uh, yeah. I think that there has been an intentional uh, war on creativity and music, and I think I know where it's coming from, but I don't want to believe it. But I think there's been a lot of uh, screwing around with stuff and... Um, I really do. I think something like Pledge, it starts out so altruistic. How can it possibly screw up like that? Yeah. Um, anyway, anyway, anyway. I digress. Well, uh, yeah. I we'll digress. talk about that another time, perhaps. Yeah. I think. yeah. But, yeah, I, 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 that's another subject. I mean, you know, the state of the music industry today, uh, that's another whole show. Yeah. Um, well, for those of you but, listening, dig in this conversation. I think we're going to have John on, on a fairly regular basis, because this is fun. Um I'm having a great time. Yeah. But I was going to mention for, for Frizzell, though, is... Oh, yeah, yeah, there yeah. There currently are 23 of them, and you can buy them as either MP3s or CD quality in FLAC format. And um, there are no, there's no rhyme or reason as to when they come out. All I can say is that... Um, Claudia Engelhardt, who has been Bill's sound engineer and kind of road manager for 30 years now, has recorded every show. So there's a guy who worked with Lee Townsend and Phyllis Oyama, Bill's manager. Lee is the producer, um, named Adam Blomberg. And Adam has the both enviable and unenviable task of listening to all these live shows and 
coming up with the ones that he thinks should be released. Um, and there are some amazing ones. Like, I never knew that Bill toured with Brian Blade, the drummer, and organist Samuel Hell. Wow. But he did. When was that? It's amazing. Uh, when? Yeah. Uh, I'd have to look that up. Or decade. Exactly. Like, what decade? Uh, oh, oh, that would be in the uh, 2000s. Okay, so, okay. Cool. Yeah. Um, and, and it was a spectacular combination, and you wonder why it never got recorded. And the answer is because Bill is working on so many different projects at any one time. I mean, he's changed labels from non such after 20 years to Savoy Jazz so he could release more than one album a year. And he put out three albums in like an eleven, an eighteen month span, but you know he's since moved on. Um, first to Sony's OK label, and he's now coming out with his first album on Blue Note in October, called Harmony, uh, which is a tremendous quartet with singer Petra Hayden, okay. uh, cellist Hank Roberts, and oh my God, I, I get, oh you love. Uh, Lucas, um, oh God, he's a new name to me. Uh, he's a guitar player and bassist. So it's a lovely record. Okay. Anyway, but the download series has been available, and if you want to read reviews of the first 17 of them, I seem to be the only journalist who's ever covered them, and I've got to finish the rest of them someday. But uh, you can read reviews of the first 17 at All About Jazz. Okay. Well, listen, man, um, we're coming up on about an hour, roughly, we've been oh, talking. I'm going to ask you a couple yep. more questions, and I just mm -hmm. want to say, you just made me realize, um, you know, I'm always aware that when I'm DJing, you know, it may be something I know and think is a classic, but it's the first time for a lot of listeners. They'd never heard the yeah. artist, they'd never heard the track. So let me just tell you, for those of you who don't know who John Kelman is and you're uh, not seeing our tweets or anything and you're just listening, it's K-E-L-M-A-N. And if you're not aware of All About Jazz, it's uh, an online resource. Uh, and John's one of the journalists that writes for that. And who else, where else can we find your work, John? Uh, you've mentioned liner notes and... Uh, and books. Um, where, where else can we find out about your views on music, my friend? Uh, actually, really, that's about it. Because I mean, I when I started writing for All About Jazz, which was actually relatively early days for me, 2004. I mean, I started writing about music in about 2001, um, which is late in life for me. But anyway, um, then All About Jazz found me and asked why I wasn't writing for them, and I looked at the site, and I went, hmm, good question. So um, <laughs> when I first started writing the web, uh, here's a good ECM story for you. When I first started writing, you know, not that I was going to start small, of course, so, you know, what did I do when I said I'm going to start writing? I'm going to write a book about ECM, which is, you know, hubris to the extreme, no, it's so not, anyway, man. No, it's not. No, it's not, man. It's it's well, go, it's going for the gold. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. But man, I yeah. Well, but here we go. Is what happened was I started interviewing artists. I'd find them on their websites, and I'd reach out and go, "Hey, I'm writing a book on ECM," and I'd do interviews, and I got about twenty-two of them. Uh, one with Bill Frizzell that ultimately did get published at All About Jazz in 2011, called the ECM Years. And if you want to read, like, about his entire chronology with ECM, that's the place. Okay. But anyway, um, so I, every time I would speak to somebody, I'd go, you know, hey, uh, Norma, can you give me a contact for Kenny Wheeler? You know, and i get to new musicians that way. So I remember speaking with Bill Frizzell and saying, well, you know, you play with Paul Motion. You think you can put me in touch? So he gave me his phone number. And I called and left a voice message. Um, the next day, I get a phone call. This would be in about 2001 or two. For, and and it, it's the, the woman whose name is Tina Pelican. 
She's the ECM publicist in New York. Okay. And we've become good friends over the years. Um, but it was very funny because she's very protective of her artists. And she said, hi, I'm Tina Pelican. I represent ECM in the United States. And I'm wondering why you're talking to musicians. So I said, oh, I'm writing a book about ECM. And she said, oh, that's great. You have a publisher. I go, uh, no. And then she says, oh, well, like any speculation for who may be publisher? Uh, no. And she <laughs> keeps asking questions, and the answers are always no. To which she finally said, you know, I think you need to get some experience before you think about something like this. And, you know, the wow. joke now, which we've talked about more than once, is I say to her that, you know, I mean, it's all your fault. That I'm writing is all your fault. <laughs> um, and her response usually is, yeah, but you don't take no for an answer. <laughs> so, it, you know, and it's true. Um, well, you got to be that way. I mean, it's unfortunate. I mean, I, I have pestered uh, a couple people. I've gotten to be friends with a couple people, but yeah. y you take your chances. Some David Allen ran screaming from me. No, not not, not quite. <laughs> but I mean, David Allen did not want to talk to me the first time I met him. The second yeah. and third time I met him, he didn't even remember who I was. But yeah. uh, Glenn Moore, I mean, I yeah. I feel horrible. I I have that disease that a lot of musicians have. Andy Partridge put it very well. I've spent my life listening to your music. Now you must listen to mine. Um, <laughs> I, I sent Glenn Moore a tape in the 80s. I called him. His wife answered. She must have thought I knew Glenn. Right. And she gave me his mom's phone number in Portland where he was staying because he was teaching. And he answered the phone. And uh, he was very gracious with me, but uh, and I've written to him a couple of times on Facebook. He's not written back to me. I don't know if he remembers, you know, like, hey, stay yeah. away from this Mark David Chapman guy. Um, <laughs> you know, so you take your chances. You you, you, you don't know how they take it, um, yep. you know, when you well, approach. It's easier, yeah. it, it's easier when you come at them as a, as a journalist for most of them. But I have, but I have my story about Fred Frith the guitarist, sure. basses, multi-instruments. He was playing with Casa Brava, his first rock band in a number of years, with uh, violinist Carla Kilstead uh, and a couple other people at this festival in Victoriaville, Quebec, this dinky little town in Quebec where 51 weeks of the year they make hockey sticks. <laughs> One week of the year, this very strange guy, great guy, Michel Levasseur puts on this very left center uh, music festival called Festival International Music Actuelle de Victoriaville. And what is music actuelle? It's whatever he thinks it is that year. <laughs> um, so he, he uh, or sorry, so, so, um, uh, God. Fred, Fred Frith. Fred Frith. He played the show, and afterwards he was outside talking to people. And he's notoriously not crazy about journalists, like John Zorn. But I, I couldn't help myself, because there's a story. I walked up to him, and I said, my name's John Kelman, I love the show. And he kind of glared at me, and I said, but I have a story. And the story is, is that when the first Henry Cow album uh, Leg End, which was the first band I heard him in, uh, came out in 1973. It was originally only in the UK. And a friend of mine who was British but lived in Canada came back from vacation and had it. And I loved it. So I sent a letter, because it said on the record, if you're a fan, send us a note. So I sent him a note. And basically saying, you know, any chance it'll ever get released in North America. And about four weeks later, a parcel arrives, you know, and this is before Amazon days, you know, 16-year-old yeah. kid. 
and this big parcel arrives, and I open it up, and there's a copy of Leg End. Um, there um, is a six-page letter by Refred. Wow. And also programs for a show that he used to participate in there that also included people like uh, Dave Stewart from, like, Egg, Hatfield in the North. Keyboard Amazing right. keyboard player. And um, people in that circle with soft machine members and stuff. And it was called the Ottawa Society. Ah. So me living in <laughs> Ottawa. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he sent me, you know, a couple of programs. Um, but I always remember that. So I told him that, and that broke the ice. You know. Yeah. And that was great. Yeah. So anyway, uh, you said you may have another question, or we may be done. Well, I, I just, I, no, I did want to throw a couple things at you, but uh, since it's 2 yeah. o'clock, let me remind you that you are listening to WZRD Chicago 88.3. Um, no, I can definitely let you go if you want to go, but I did have... I just, no, I'm here. I want to throw out a couple names, and I just want yeah. you to tell me if you've seen them, talk to them, interview them, just impressions. Mm -hmm. Have you ever had a chance to see Tergay Ribdahl? Oh, many... Many times. Ah, you're lucky, um, man. And you're I lucky. also did the liners for the old and new Master Series box, which was the first time reissue of Odyssey, uh, his amazing 1975 album in its entirety as a double record, uh, plus a live album recorded the next year with most of the same band and a Swedish radio big band. Yeah, I so, had, I never know. bought that box yet. Yeah, but you did oh, the liners. Right, okay, yeah, I will. If you haven't heard, it's beautiful, beautiful, and and that was, sorry, no, no, I'll just go ahead, man. Oh, I was going to say that was I think in two thousand nine, maybe. Okay. Um, and the thing that was great about it is that album defined what was sort of a style for him that was a curious reversal. Um, one of the things ECM has been very strong at is the idea of rubato playing. So there may be changes, but no time. So um, the Ripdoll thing, though, was he would have a firm rhythm. Um, in that case, John Christensen, and I never pronounced his name right, this Great eight string electric basses. Finding Ovenio, I think. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I can't pronounce it either. Yeah, and, he, and I should because I've been in Norway a lot. But anyway, they played rhythm. And then the trombonist that played with Ripsaw and, you know, what rock, you know, what jazz rocky album has trombone as a second lead instrument? Yeah. But anyway, they would play rubato lines floating over that firm rhythm, which was a different way of doing it. Anyway, so I've, I've met Terry uh, many times. I saw the Dechandra group uh, opening for Towner and Abercrombie in Montreal in, like, 1980. Did you say the Dechandra group? Yep, which was him, Polly Mickleborg, yeah, and, and Young Christensen. Oh, but I'm so envious. Polly and Terry played organ. I love that album, man. Yeah, it was very good live. Um, and then the next time I saw him was with the Skyward Trio with uh, keyboardist Stola Storlokan and drummer and a guy who became a friend of mine and who sadly passed recently, Paolo Vanaccia, um, a tremendous Italian drummer who you can find on many ECM records. Yeah. And um, who struggled with cancer for 10 years and finally succumbed. But he, one of the funniest, warmest guys you'd ever meet. Terry was a bit of a shy, has been a bit of a shy guy. But one, only until you got to know him. You okay. Know? Okay. And, and uh, so, yeah, he's, and, as a, and for me, as a guitarist, um, there's really nobody who sounds like him. His use of whammy bar and his, his harmonic conception, 
Yeah. Oh, also the fact that he's a classical writer. Yeah. And the reason he's a classical writer is I can relate to because he saw 2001 A Space Odyssey and that album or movie features a lot of music by the Hungarian microtonal composer Georgi Ligeti. Yes. And I love that stuff. And yeah. so did Terry enough to go home and say, I am going to go to the conservatory in Norway and learn how to do this. And that's how he began writing classical music. And he still writes, like, purely classical pieces, you know? Yeah. So uh, influential in so many ways. Yeah. Listen, man, I, I'm realizing we got to do this about just about ECM. We got to do this again because the, the, oh, yeah. the time just flies. So, I have, I, I'm having fun. Yeah, man, I'm going to... Uh, I'm going to cue up this piece by um, pianist, keyboardist, composer Reiner Bruninghaus from his ah. first album, Frewet. Yep. Um, and uh, Die Flusse Genoff, I think is the name of the track. Good enough. <laughs> John Kalman, thank you, man. And I, I think we're hey. going to be doing this again on the regular. So uh, let's get some music going here, and I will talk to you and say goodbye to you briefly off air. And just uh, before yep. I do, in preparation for this interview, um, was there anything that you thought you'd want to say that we didn't get to in particular well, dealing with ECM? I didn't really think about preparation because I write the same way. I don't really... I'm a believer in improvisation and in, in everything and uh, so I didn't really prepare I was figuring if you had anything you were going to be specific about you'd have told me <laughs> yeah um, well I'm the same way I I want to I, I kind of uh, it's kind of a weird source of inspiration but I, I really like listening to Mark Marin's interviews do you do you know who that is no Okay, he he uh, doesn't talk to any of the musicians we dig, but he's a comedian and he has a podcast and he talks to all kinds of people. And How do you spell his last name? Uh, M-A-R-O-N. I'll tell you who he did a okay. great interview with, though, a couple weeks ago. Uh, check out the interview, and I've been meaning to tell you folks that, that hang we all hang out every Saturday. Go to WTF. That I can't say the name of his podcast because we can't swear on... <laughs> but it's What the... <laughs> It's mm -hmm. WTF, and um, he just talked to Sean Lennon a couple weeks ago, and it was awesome. Oh, wow. I don't know. Are you digging yeah. uh, Claypool Lennon? I sure am. Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay, man. All right, listen, I'm going to put on some Reiner Bruning House for everybody, and I will say goodbye to you off air. Okay, John and Kel... thank you for having me. It's been a blast. Hey, love it, man. Okay, Reiner Bruning House with oboe, trumpet, and percussion. Reiner on keyboards. I'll see you on the other side.